Administrator Isaacman, congratulations. It is day one. It was not a straightforward process to get here. What does this mean to you? This is clearly a role that you wanted and that you were prepared to fight for. Now we're here. Just reflect on that a little bit. Well, Ed, I mean, I'm incredibly grateful. I mean, I grew up as the ultimate NASA fan. I mean, I went to space camp when I was a kid. I never could have possibly dreamed of being an astronaut someday or certainly getting the chance to work alongside, you know, the absolute most talented minds in America at this space agency. So, yeah, I'm, I'm having an extraordinary day. Just left the Oval Office about an hour ago where the President of the United States signs probably the most important national space policy since the Kennedy era. Yes. You know, recommitting us to the moon, but also establishing an enduring presence. So I'm having a wonderful day. I, uh, I'm just so grateful to be here. Administrator Isaacman, that executive order titled Ensuring American Space Superiority. We have limited time, but the mainstay of it is reaffirming the Artemis program, beating China back to the moon, reforming how the agency does acquisition, pushing new technologies like nuclear power, next-gen missile defense, um, but also shifting power from the Space Council over to OSTP, that latter part. How has this changed your job on day one? Well, I, I think this has only made my job a heck of a lot easier. So all the credit to Director Kratzios and the OSTP team that worked very hard on this national space policy. I would say this goes beyond just a recommitment to the Artemis program. This is the next big leap. You know, we're not just going back to the moon under this space policy. We're declaring we're going back and we're going to establish the infrastructure. I mean, who doesn't? What space-loving fan out there doesn't want to see a lunar base? And then we're going to invest in the technology that's going to enable frequent long duration missions to Mars and beyond, whether that be through nuclear propulsion or nuclear surface power, which obviously has a number of useful applications, be it the moon or Mars. So it's an exciting day. It's absolutely extraordinary national space policy. And one that I'm not surprised to see, frankly, it was under President Trump's first term that we returned American spaceflight capability to the United States after a 10 year hiatus. It's when he kicked off the Artemis program. And now we're taking it to the next level. Administrator Isaacman, the question I get most for you right now in response to everything that's happened in, in the last few weeks is how is NASA still relevant, right? In a world where the private sector is dominating activity, it's dominating innovation. What is your answer to that question? Well, I, you know, that seems to be a common misconception. I mean, you go back to the 1960s, NASA didn't go at it alone. I mean, we had McDonnell Douglas, we had Boeing, we had Northrop. These were all critical vendors and contractors that helped us achieve the near impossible of sending American astronauts to the moon and bring them back safely to Earth. Some of these companies still exist and play a huge part in the Artemis program. And then, of course, there are some new companies, you know, like SpaceX, who's given us rapid reusability of their vehicles and Blue Origin and Stoke. But it's the same thing. NASA is leading in the ultimate high ground of space. And let's focus a little bit more on science, too, in that. I mean, there, as much as I would love to see private companies and academic institutions building Hubble telescopes and James Webb space telescope and putting rovers on the moon, that is squarely in the responsibility of NASA. If NASA isn't out there trying to unlock the secrets of the universe, no one else is going to do it. We are scrambling a little bit, Administrator, to react to this executive order, which is just broken at the time that you and I are speaking. Clearly, Artemis is weaved throughout it. It is a mainstay of it. Your predecessor, who was in that role on an interim basis, reopened essentially the competitive field. So, for example, with SpaceX's human landing system, the contracts for Artemis 3, how should we expect you to approach new RFPs or any real change to those existing contracts? Or will the field be open under your tenure? Well, I, I think it's worth pointing out, Ed, that both SpaceX and Blue Origin already received contracts for human landing system vehicles to return American astronauts to the moon. Both organizations are putting an impressive amount of their own resources into a capability that's vitally important. And honestly, not just for the return to the moon, but their reusable heavy launch vehicles are what's going to lay the foundation for missions to Mars and beyond. I don't think it was lost on either vendor that whichever lander was available first to ensure that America achieves its, its strategic objectives on the moon is the one we were going to go with. So I don't think that there is a 
a lot has actually changed in that dynamic. NASA is fortunate to have SpaceX. We're very fortunate to have Blue Origin as critical vendors. No different than uh, Administrator Webb relied on a number of really key contractors during the 1960s. How does this executive order change those contracts and change the approach to those projects? Oh, I, th I think this executive order takes things to a whole nother scale. I mean, we're not just going back to the moon for the footsteps and planting the flag. I mean, the president calls out, we are returning to the moon. We are establishing the infrastructure to realize the scientific, economic, and national security benefits. You know, the president is no stranger to uh, ambitious real estate endeavors. We're going to build a moon base. You know, we're going to build a base on the moon. And not only that, we're committed to the technology that's going to take us beyond the moon. The commitment to uh, nuclear propulsion and nuclear surface power is going to be a key enabling capability. It's going to allow us to work alongside a very healthy field of commercial contractors to set up missions for Mars and beyond. You know, as I mentioned before, I do think this space policy is the most significant commitment to space since the Kennedy era. Administrator Isaacman, that balance has been debated throughout this whole process. There is America's priority for the moon. And then there is sort of Elon Musk's and SpaceX's greater stated goal of making humankind an interplanetary species, getting us to Mars. It's been asked of you time and time again, but how will you get the balance right between those two strategies? Well, I think, look, it, we're very grateful for organizations like SpaceX, also like Blue Origin. I mean, it is a, an incredible field of commercial space companies that exist today. I mean, you, you can talk about Stoke and ULA and Rocket Lab and Firefly. You have a number of companies that are contributing to this grand endeavor. And the simple reality is rapid reusability of heavy lift launch vehicles is going to enable us to send mass, you know, whether it's payload, it's cargo, it's humans to the moon or Mars. Now, NASA's job is to constantly be recalibrating back to the near impossible. When we crack the code on a key enabling technology, it's mature enough, we hand it off to industry and we let innovation make it better and drive down costs. And then NASA works on what industry can't. And that's why I keep coming back to nuclear, but that's also why President Trump put it in the national space policy. Commercial companies are not gonna be building and launching nuclear reactors, but this is a capability that allows us to deliver power when we're not in the vicinity of some, which is applicable to obviously large portions of the moon, but especially as you get farther away from the sun on Mars, where in order to have human spaceflight missions to and from, you're going to need to be able to manufacture propellant on the Martian surface. And that's going to take a lot of power. And that also brings us back to nuclear. So it's all about that balance. You, you do have that correct. Commercial industry has been with NASA since the beginning. We were fortunate to have such a healthy industry. And we're very fortunate to have a national space policy that prioritizes NASA on doing the near impossible. The budget. When we put it out there that, that you and I would be speaking on the day you're sworn in and there's an EO from the president, everyday Americans want to know all about the budget. How are you going to approach NASA's budget? Where are their taxpayer dollars going to go? But ultimately, it goes back to that original question on relevance for NASA, how NASA can do something meaningful with the budget that's available to it. Well, I think 20, whether it's 20 billion or $25 billion a year is a very meaningful budget. I mean, that's a lot of dollars that taxpayers are entrusting NASA with. And as I said during my hearing, you know, senators representing both parties, we will absolutely maximize the scientific value of every dollar the agency is afforded. I think these are a lot of resources that, where NASA is going to be able to do several material programs in parallel setting up the grand return for the moon, making investments in nuclear power and nuclear propulsion for deeper space applications, and a science portfolio so that we can see missions like Hubble and James Webb and more rovers on Mars and beyond launching with even greater frequency. You've talked a lot about inspiring the next generation. My big picture question is your strategy for returning NASA to its kind of legacy, where it was at the forefront of exploration and at the forefront of innovation. But really what I want to ask is, if there's a college kid out there, an engineer, who's confronted with the choice of going to go and work in the private sector, SpaceX, Rocket Lab, anywhere else, or go and work at NASA, what would your message to that engineering student be? 
Well, I think first and foremost, right? I mean, NASA focusing on the mission, doing the near impossible, just as the president you know, established in this national space policy is the absolute best way to inspire the next generation to contribute to this grand endeavor. And we're grateful for those that go in commercial industry, you know, whether it's again, Blue Origin, SpaceX, Rocket Lab, they're gonna need fantastic engineers contributing to that endeavor. For those that wanna come into NASA, the best way we can attract that talent is by doing what others cannot. And that's why, again, you focus on building nuclear spaceships that commercial industry is not gonna be able to do. You focus on the grand telescopes the rovers, the probes we're going to send out there to help unlock the secrets of the universe, that's going to attract talent that want to be part of that mission.